YouTube family. Welcome back. It's your boy Crispy Clean Cliff for Cliff World TV. Y'all already know how I'm rocking, man. And today, we're going to take a journey into the interesting life of Los Angeles, California rapper Brick Baby. One might even say he's a public figure right now for being the co-host with Adam22 on the largest West Coast media hip-hop outlet, No Jumper. So today, we're going to jump into the deep dive life of Brick Baby. Y'all make sure y'all grab y'all popcorn, man. This one gonna be interesting. Name aside, it be outside, nigga, that's live as us. Every time I up outside, we trying to line them up. Brick Baby was born 1987 in South Central Los Angeles. He grew up in a household that had money flowing in and money flowing out. And this would be due to his mother. Brick Baby's mom would actually be notorious for having the best work in South Central. She had however much you needed. She was the Brick Lady of Los Angeles. Brick would go up in the Sloth and the Cranshaw area, and however, he had also contributed his childhood upbringing to being around the Sloth and the Adams area as well. He'd grow up like every other minority child in South Central LA, where the influence of gang culture and drug dealing was omnipresent. City of Los Angeles are down from last year. That's because many of the black gangs continue to honor a truce that was forged during the riots. Such is not the case in the county. Latino and Asian gangs are on a record pace for homicides because the gang population is growing and truce is not in their vocabulary. And at the tender age of nine years old, Brick Baby's mom's house would be raided and she would be indicted. They would give her leniency because she was the only parent at the time in the household. She would be indicted in 1995 for running the drug operation, in which case his mother had two tons of the Peruvian booger sugar. His family was a family of hustlers. Both of his parents had did pen time. Brick Baby and his younger siblings would eventually move in with their grandmother, in which case his grandmother already had a house full of young men in development. See, his grandmother had the responsibility of adopting all of his cousins because at the time, the crack epidemic was sweeping through the streets of Los Angeles, and this would also affect the livelihood of those who indulged in the drug consumption and those who sold it. Brick really never had a porch to jump off of, but after his mom's incarceration, he had engaged heavily into the gangbang culture that Los Angeles, California is most famously known for. Growing up in Los Angeles, 80% of the minority teenagers would pledge their allegiance to a gang. Brick would not be the exception. In fact, he came from a family that didn't gangbang at all. All they did was hustle. So one might say that joining the gang was moving backwards. He had ultimately decided to join the overhill fraction of the rolling 60s. As a youth, Brick would get into scuffles and even run into fractions with the police, but nothing too major. He'd adopt the hood nickname Shitty Cuz as a younger representative of the name Shitty. Ironically enough, Brick Baby is the older homie of Eric Holder, aka Shitty Cuz from Rolling 60s, whom assassinated Nipsey Hussle in front of his own store March 11, 2019. Brick also had ties to the Harlem 30 Crips. This is due to the fact that his grandmother stayed off of Slauson and Adams, and majority of his male cousins were also from 30s. At the age of 14, Brick Baby would go down for having a loaded Tech 9 handgun, and he'd only spend six days in Juvenile Hall, in which case, his co-defendant would take the gun charge, allowing him to be released. He'd return to Juvenile a handful of times for probation violations, and it would be his good grades that'd get him a slap on the wrist. Brick Baby would attend Pacific Hills High School in West Hollywood, formerly known as Bel Air High Prep. While attending the school, formerly known as Bel Air High Prep, Brick Baby would receive leniency on his court cases after getting a scholarship for basketball to attend Clark University in Atlanta, Georgia. Brick Baby would also be cousins to Los Angeles recording artist Kid Inc. Kid Inc. would take Brick Baby on tour while his music career had just started to flourish. But this would be after his mom would be released and she'd hear word from him joining the Rolling 60s. And at the age of 16, she'd send him down to Atlanta, Georgia to live with his family. It was because she was worried that her son was going down the wrong path and that he may get himself in some trouble that he couldn't get out of. So if he didn't leave Los Angeles at that moment, 
that maybe she wouldn't be able to turn his life around. And after hearing about him having run-ins with the Los Angeles Police Department and then recovering the gun from Briggs, she had decided that, that was the last straw and she had sent him to Atlanta with his relatives. This would be the years that BMF would take over the Atlanta rap scene and inspire what we call now to be Black Hollywood. His cousin and his sister were both dating members of BMF. And those fellas from BMF would urge Brick Baby to stay out of trouble because he had came down with his California style of robbing. While being fresh up out of Juvenile Hall, Brick Baby would find that Atlanta was sweeter than California. While everyone in Atlanta was known for hustling, Brick would come from a different environment into which the hate was always present. Being in Atlanta would open his eyes up to the hustlers working together and getting money with no hate. See, Brick was used to robbing in Los Angeles as a means of support, but here in Atlanta, he can trade in his blowers for a digital scale and sandwich bags. And at the age of 18, he would run an elaborate marijuana operation out of the very same college dorms that he laid his head at. Well, I, hell yeah, I, could, <laughs> <laughs> I caught a case on campus uh, at like 17. I just turned 18, matter of fact, and uh, I got caught with like 35 pounds of weed. Brick was introduced to the lifestyle of hustling and making fast money hand over fist. He dated an actor girl who go unnamed, in which case he would have shipments of marijuana shipped to her dorm room. She would be the one who would actually tip off the campus officers that Brick was getting 35 pounds of marijuana mailed to him in the mail, which was a federal crime. He'd actually be kicked off of the campus and he'd actually taken a $60,000 loss. Ironically enough, Brick would claim responsibility for turning Atlanta into Crips. And get this, his sister was married to the modern day Atlanta rapper, trap rapper, Pee Wee Longway. Vanilla ice on my neck froze, blue bitch your legs on me snapping. She came right in with the snappy tackle, four trap spot like Monopoly. He had just got out of the penitentiary and would offer Brick Baby a place to stay. Pee Wee and Brick would start MPA or Money Powers and Ammunition. It was in the Zone 3 of Atlanta that Brick would recall being very comfortable living in the Bankhead projects with Pee Wee Longway, being that he came from the hood. While everyone wanted to be bloods because of their favorite rapper Lil Wayne, Pee Wee Longway and Brick Baby would be responsible for turning the large majority of the street guys in Atlanta into Crips. Brick went to Atlanta during the years of Hurricane Katrina. Brick Baby would be responsible for introducing those street guys to the fraction of Atlanta's rolling 60s Crips. Brick would meet Young Thug through Pee Wee Longway. See, Young Thug and Pee Wee Longway were cousins. After the popularity of the drug MDMA or Molly, Brick would find that he liked the feeling that it gave him and one day he'd just get in the booth and try it out. Artist Young Thug was originally a part of the MPA imprint and in 2009, Brick Baby would introduce his rolling 60s rap peer Nipsey Hussle to the Young Young Thug in hopes that he can bridge the musical gap between Atlanta and South Central. But Nipsey wasn't so sure about Young Thug. He was hesitant due to Young Thug being known for his grimy and slimy ways at the time. Thug would be the one who would motivate Brick Baby to rap because Young Thug had started catching traction in his own lane. He had contributed his rap style to Atlanta due to him living in Atlanta at the time. His raps were reflective of a man who uses designer drugs while wearing designer clothes and driving foreign cars. Brick Baby said that it was his favorite rapper, Lil Wayne, that would pique his interest in drinking lean and consuming other drugs. He'd start selling drugs. He'd always test the product despite big instructions on never getting high on your own supply. He recalled using Yerks when they were $4 and getting pints of drink when it was $120. It's safe to say he was an experimental guy. Young Thug would be the artist of the forefront for pushing MPA as a rap conglomerate. His style would be the first to catch notice. At the time, where Lil Wayne was still at the top of the charts and the top chief of the game, Thug was etching his way into his own lane while being influenced by the rapper. Brick Baby went to jail in 2012 and did 16 months. When he came home, MPA was now part of Gucci Mane's 1017 imprint, making them the MPA 1017. Gucci had Thug as a full-time rapper and in full-time rapper mode. And Gucci Mane would encourage Pee Wee to take things serious. See, Pee Wee Longway and Gucci Mane were already close friends with QCP, 
who was close friends with Coach K. But sadly, these would be the years that Gucci Mane would be battling his lean and drug addiction, and the deals with 1017 would fall through before Brick could use the 1017 imprint on his first mixtape, Son of a Brick Lady. In that era, Gucci Mane would have new artists all around the country in East Atlanta. It would be Hood Rich Rip and Nate from Mixtape Kitchen that would encourage Brick Baby to take the music seriously. But it was his manager, Brodisky, that would find out about him while vacationing in Paris with Bay Area artist Lil Debbie. Who actually got in your ear, though, and like really made you believe that you had it to be an actual rapper yourself and to start working on putting that full project together and everything? Uh, Hood Rich, uh, uh, Rip, mm. Rip, and Nate from Mac Mixtape Kitchen. They like, man, do it. Like, you got something going, do it. And then my manager, he like, like, cause Brodinski, you, I was fucking with Brodinski for a second. So Brodinski found out about me through like a long way project or something. It was way in Paris. Lil Debbie and my manager was way in Paris. You know, mm -hmm. Lil Debbie, that's my best friend. So still. Yeah, still my best friend. Okay, right now. interesting. Yeah, she used to come visit. Debbie me. would actually take an interest in Brick Baby, and the two would start dating. This was around the same time that Lil Debbie's best friend Krayshawn was on fire with her song Gucci. <laughs> Lil Debbie and Brick Baby would ultimately end up moving in together, and this would be due to the fact that Brick Baby had just gotten to a shootout in front of his mom's house. He had to relocate and Debbie would be all open arms. Brick Baby would get into an incident in Hollywood when the parking valet guy had backed into his Range Rover. And right on Sunset Boulevard, he'd jump out with the blower and proceed to assault the valet driver. And after six months, he'd be tipped off by the rental car place, and ultimately he would be picked up in a rental car that wasn't in his name, but instead it was in his rap cousin Kid Ink's name, and later he'd bond out. Brick Baby would put out a tape called Nasty Dilla, but he wasn't taking it seriously because at the time he was balling out of control. He recalls having about $400,000 and a nice house at the time. So this would make him lose focus and he would blow off video shoots because he was too busy entertaining strippers. One day, Brick Baby and the unnamed co-defendant would go on Melrose one day to buy shoes for Flight Club. He'd also come to talk to a buddy from New York who had just gotten into an altercation with one of his close friends. Brick would tell him that it wasn't safe to move the way he was moving, being that he wasn't even from out there. Brick's accomplice would ultimately go inside of the store unknowingly to Brick and steal about 10 bathing ape jackets valued at about or around $200 a piece. Desto Dub, the owner of an awful lot of cough syrup, would coincidentally be hitting a jug right around the corner from the very same store. Brick's co-defendant would run out the store and be chased by the store owner, ultimately knocking out the store owner and Desto Dub would pick up a random babe jacket and by doing that, he'd unintentionally tie himself into a robbery. Now, mind you, Dub, so uh, before I even get to that Dub part. Dub just happened to see you, right? Me and Dub just happened to pull up on Melrose together. Right. And he had some juice, I had some juice. I'm like, bro, I just bought a pint. Go get some pineapple sodas. He like, I'm finna go serve this nigga right here. You know, Dub was still in the street. He like, I'm finna go serve this nigga some juice right around the building. Uh -huh. So on the camera, it looked like Dub wouldn't case the joint for us. Um. It looked like he circled the building. Brick's co-defendant would run out the store and be chased by the store owner, ultimately knocking out the store owner, and Desto Dub would pick up a random babe jacket, and by doing that, he'd unintentionally tie himself into a robbery. And to make matters worse, the store owner went into a coma. But being that Brick Baby was the rapper and most notable, everyone pointed fingers at Brick Baby. And one day, he had rent a car for a business, and after being broadcasted as the assailant that had caused the attack on Melrose, the rental car place would ultimately turn him in. His co-defendant would actually go on to tell on Brick Baby for a separate crime involving a homicide. He'd actually tell detectives that Brick Baby had information and knew who had committed such heinous crimes. This is why he ended up doing so much time on that robbery charge that he didn't do, because he refused to cooperate in the case for detectives. Brick Baby was already on parole to the point where he couldn't make bail, because in order to do that, he would have to admit guilt in that case, and ultimately, it would be a parole violation, so he ended up doing four years. 
And even if he had the option, he wouldn't have took it because Desto Dub was taking advantage of the COVID-19 restrictions. And by making his clothes available, while everyone else was shut down, Desto Dub would gain world recognition for his awful lot of cough syrup brand. And Brick Baby didn't want to throw him off of his trajectory. Brick Baby was sent to Vegas on a separate case where he'd be put into a dorm for the Bloods. And at the time, the only 60s member in the pod was asleep. He had had all eyes on him. And after he had shown so much mercy to others in dorms where they were outnumbered, all he had to do was catch one fade. Um, that's what they was going to have to do. I did notice you came out looking yeah, kind of broad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, was in there, I was in there hammering shit, so they, that's what they was going to have to do. Mm. They was going to have to run at least five. Right. On the hood, because it wasn't no, it was only the, the that was my size. He was a little bit, he about This would speak to his respect level between L.A. and Las Vegas. Brick Baby was also fighting that case in Nevada where he had purchased a home in Porto Ranch. His cousin Kid Inc. had a show with the Venetian in Vegas that weekend and he would tell his friend to stay home with the money they had made and to handle business. But instead, his friend would pull up to the apartment complex where Brick Baby was at visiting a female friend and he'd ultimately put a designer backpack totaling $200,000 in the trunk. And unknowingly to him, he had accidentally hit the pop trunk button and the backpack was stolen. Brick Baby would then go on a tantrum. He would actually even threaten the project manager and he would go around just slashing tires so no one can get in and get out. That $200,000 was serious and he wanted it back. He'd end up getting into it with his female friend sometime down the line, into which case she had offered information on that case where he slashed the tires and threatened the property manager. He'd be sent to Vegas for 30 days and that's it. And in a crazy turn of events, in Vegas is where he had run into future No Jumper co-host, Crip Mac. I'm the nifty nickel on And unlike the friendly encounter that Brick Baby had, he actually had to run multiple phase. In fact, if it wasn't for Brick Baby, the brims inside of that dorm was gonna pack him out. While being incarcerated, Brick Baby gained a lot of weight and he got his squabbles up on a daily. And sometimes, He'd even hit his ops with a tiny low dip. Came down to tear one night, like, they like, hey, where you from? I'm asleep. He like, call me Nat Bash and D-Dog, West Side Over. I hear the Nat Bash and I get up out the bed. I get on the bars like, hey, stay in your cell when the showers, cuz I'm gonna be down there. I'm coming out at you, from 6 0. Neighborhood, like, you talking about you, Nat Bash, and stay in your cell. I'd be down there in the morning. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I was about like 200 pounds. That was like a skinny, tall though. With hands though, like yeah. I get in there with it, we, we going. And coming from where I'm from, we got a, a fighting style. Like the 60s, like we like, our blocking style is different. You know we coming from our area cause we all trained to say like, well we fighting. You get what I'm saying? And then we got the tiny low dip. It's like that we do when we fight like that the enemies can't stop. like. Cause we dip and cover it down there, knock out every time. You know what I'm wow. saying? So it's while in jail, Brick Baby would receive some terrible, terrible news. Nipsey Hussle was shot and killed in front of his store. In the attempt to find out who did it, only thing that the people kept saying and gave him the phone call was, "It's Lil You, You, It's Lil You," and that's when it hit him. Man, his little homie had just taken out one of his best childhood friends. While being incarcerated, it wouldn't be just Nipsey Hussle who'd lose his life. It'd also be Draco the Ruler, which would take a hard toll on Brick Baby as well, being that they had gotten to multiple different squabbles with the Englewood gangster family bloods. Currently, you can catch Brick Baby on No Jumper as a co-host, and this would all be in the midst of No Jumper reinventing the platform. He would go on a promo run speaking about Nipsey Hussle, where he'll call Nipsey Hussle's big homie Cowboy a snitch for getting on the stand and pointing the finger. This would cause a lot of friction between the two and would spark a crazy amount of back and forth exchanges, into which case, Cowboy asked to catch the fade. Brick Baby seemingly turned the fade down, saying that he would not fight with rats. Brick Baby was released 2021, and since then he's been a fixture on a no-jumper platform where he is currently running to friction with his own neighborhood, prompting a lot of them to state that he wasn't even from 60s. Brick Baby has attached himself to the younger fraction of the rolling 60s, 
score gang clicked and continues to push artists like New Jack where he was seen signing the artists. From a somewhat nice neighborhood in the Overhills in South Central Los Angeles to the college dorms at Clark in Atlanta, Georgia. This was the story of Brick Baby, man. I let y'all know where he came from. I let y'all know some of the adversities he faced, some of the run-ins with the laws. I even let y'all know that his mama was the Brick Lady, man. It's your boy Chris McLean Cliff of Cliff World TV. Y'all jump in the comment section and let me know who y'all want to hear next. I'm gone. Yeah, I'm flipping like I'm done one. I'ma stop at the store, sell me an onion. Go and get some backwoods in the back of Funyun. Let a nigga play me sweet and he gon' meet the honey bun. I ain't ride with it unless he got a hundred round drum. Hit that nigga with the drink, he gon' butt up out I'm bomb. Hit her with the dash.